Hello, my name is Kishwani. S K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the official SAT study guide. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The problem that we are about to solve is the one that you will find on page number 611. 611. And today is our lesson number 57. Let's take a look at it. The very first one. We are told that x raised to negative half power equals 1 over 3. Let's first understand what that means. Well, let's first understand what does it mean if we are told that a variable is raised to a negative 1 half power. This is same as 1 over x raised to positive 1 half which of course is same as 1 over square root of x and that we are told equals one third that we are told is equal to one third so if we pick up our story from there if we pick our story from here we are, so now we know that 1 over 1 over square root of x equals one third we are interested in finding out the value of x because the question is how much is how much is uh, the value of x plus z? So we are interested in finding the value of x. If we square both sides, square this side and square this side. If we square both sides, on this side what we end up is 1 squared is just 1 and square of square root of x would simply be x. So 1 over x equals, again 1 squared is going to be 1 and square of 3 is going to be 9. There you go. So now we have 1 over x equals 1 over 9. If 1 over x equals 1 over 9, that implies that x is equal to 9. Now we can work on the other part, which is the value of z. Let's see what we can do about z. z is a very straightforward one. z is actually more straightforward. Let's put z over here. We are told that y raised to z, y raised to z, equals 16. equals 16. We are also told that z has to be more than y. z has to be more than y. There are, there are, there are, there are only a couple of possibilities here. y raised to z is equal to 16. We could not have had 16 raised to 1 would be 16. That, that would work. But in this case, in this case y would be 16 and z would be 1. But we are told that z has to be more than y. If z has to be more than y, then that scenario is not going to work. How about how about 2 raised to 2 raised to 4? 2 raised to 4 is equal to 16, isn't it? 2 raised to 4 is equal to 16. So we can write this as we can write 16 as 2 raised to 4. So y raised to z equals to 2 raised to 4. That tells us that y is equal to 2 and z is equal to 4. And as you can see, z is 4. Just z is more than y. Just give me one second, I'm still here. So now z is more than y. We satisfy that condition and we find out that y is equal to 2 and z is equal to 4. The question is how much is x plus z? Well, z is 4, we found, and x is 9. So x plus z, x plus z would simply be 9 plus 4 or 13. The answer is d, as in David. Answer is D as in David. I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. The answer is D. And that was problem number, well actually that was the very first problem on the page there. Problem number seven. Let's go to the next one then. The next problem. So one more time here. Here's what ha here's what's going on. Let me explain one more time. This part that we did here was for the X part. Perhaps I should not have done it like this. I hope it's okay, it's not too crowded. So one x raised to negative negative half, which is same as one over x raised to half, which is equal to one over square root of x. And that part we are told is equal to one third. So if we square both sides, if we square both sides, we find that one over x equals one over nine. If one over x equals one over nine, then x must be nine. 
So that was the x part. And then y raised to z, we are told, equals 16. Given the fact that z has to be more than y, the only possibility that we have here is 2 raised to 4. In which case y would be 2, z would be 4, and we can figure out that x is equal to 4, z is equal, x is equal to 9 rather, z is equal to 4, and their sum is 13. Next one. Number 8. Number 8. In number 8 we are given a semicircle which goes all the way from 0 to 8 this is 8 0 and of course this is 0 0 and the midpoint is right here 4 0 let's see what the question is asking which of the following which of the following are the x coordinate of two points on this semicircle whose y coordinates are equal. Well, let's find out. Where are the y coordinates going to be equal? This is 4, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The y coordinates are going to be equal at the y coordinates of this point A. Let's call it A and B. The y coordinates are going to be equal at point A and point B, which is 1, and 7. Do we have 1 and 7 in the answer choices? No, we do not. I'm going in a roundabout way on purpose, you understand? Other place where they're going to be equal are going to be 2 and 6. Let's call them point C and D. Point C and D. 2 and 6. Do we have 2 and 6? Voila! 2 and 6 is the answer. 2 and 6 are the two points where the y coordinates are going to be equal. The y coordinates are going to be equal. The y coordinates of point C and D are going to be equal at when x is equal to 2 and when x is equal to 6. And the place where they're going to be equal is 3 and 5. C, D, let's call it E and F. At 3 and 5. 3 and 5. I'm going to raise that 4, 0 because it's getting too crowded. There we go. So, at A and B, at A and B, point A, point A and point B, at point A and point B, the y coordinates are equal. Point A and point B. So is C and D. So is C. And D at point C and point D, the y coordinates are going to be equal, which is, which is of course one of the answer choices, 2 and 6. And they are also going to be equal at point E and F, which is 3 and 5. 3 and 5. But of course, you're not going to see, we're not going to see 3 and 5 in the answer choices, we're not going to see 1 and 7 in the answer choices, because obviously we can't have more than one right answer. So they give you 5 answer choices, 4 of them are of course wrong. But these, all of these are points. Of course, there are infinite points here, but these are the three that are easy to see. And that was the end of that. The answer is C at 2 and 6. At 2 and 6 at point C and D. The correct answer, three answers that are listed here, they are all correct. The one that appears in the answer choice is uh, 2 and 6. Problem number 9. Problem number 9. Let's see what we have here. If p is an integer, so we are told that p is a whole number, and 3 is the remainder when 2 times p plus 7 is divided by 5. So we have this quantity 2 times p plus 7 when divided by 5, we are told that the remainder is 3. Question simply is what's the value of p? But the easiest and simplest way is to just do it out and see what happens. If P happens to be 2, which is the answer choice A, if P happens to be 2, 2 plus 7 is 11, 11 divided by 5 will have a remainder of 1. We'll have a remainder of 1. Because we'll have 10 divided by 5, which is 2, and then we'll have a remainder of 1. So that doesn't work. We're looking for a remainder of 3. In B, 
we are told that p is equal to 3. Let's see if that works. 2 times 3 plus 7 divided by 5. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 plus 7 is 13. There you go. 13 divided by 5 does have, I can't write remainder, does have remainder of 3. Voila. The answer is B. And if you do it out all the others, you will see that all the others will give some, some other remainder. Let's do it quickly, okay, orally. 4 times, 4 times 2 is going to be 8. I'm doing number C now. 4 times 2 is going to be 8. 8 plus 7 is 15. 15 divided by 5 will have a remainder of 0. In D, we have 5. 2 times 5 is 10. 10 plus 7 is going to be 17. 17 divided by 5 is going to give us a remainder of 2. We need a remainder of 3. D is not going to work. E says 6. 2 times 6 is 12. 12 plus 7 is 19. 19 divided by 5 will have a remainder of 4. The only answer choice that gives us the remainder of 3 is B when P happens to be 3 also. Do you understand? It's just a fluke that the value of the P is 3 and so is the remainder. They're doing it just to freak you out. That's it. 13 divided by 5, as we said, would have a remainder of 3. Let's go to the next one, number 10. Number 10. Stacy noted that she is both the 12th tallest and the 12th shortest students in her class. Interesting. If everybody in the class is of different height, how many students are in the class? Interesting problem. Alright. So she is the 12th one. We are told that she is the 12th one in the class. But if the, she is the 12th one, let's, let's imagine in our mind, let's picture in our mind that everybody is standing there in a line from the shortest side to the to the uh, from the shortest person to the tallest person in the class and according to their height there and because we are told everybody is of different height so if you put the shortest person to her left and the, and, the, and taller, per, taller people to her right and she is the twelfth one which means that we must have eleven on on this side these are the short ones there are 11 people in the class, there are 11 people in the class who are shorter than her, which is why she is the 12th shortest. And of course, there are also 11 people, 11 in the class, who are taller than her, which is why she is also the 12th tallest. There are 11 people who are taller than her. So if you start from this end, from the tallest person, there are 11 of them before her. And she is the 12th tallest. So if you start from this end, from the shortest person in the class, then there are 11 people who are shorter than her. And she is the 12th shortest. If she is the 12th shortest and the 12th tallest in the class, which means there must be 11 people shorter than her, there must be 11 people taller than her. If there are 11 people taller than her, and 11 people taught shorter than her, that's 22, including Stacy herself. The question was what, how many people in the class? We mustn't forget Stacy herself. So that's 22, 11 people on, on her right hand side, 11 people on her left hand side, and Stacy herself, that's 23. The answer is B. There are 23 people in the class. I will see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.